Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Mr. Robbins back again to continue and wrap up period 7A by talking about the last little bit of stuff and ending the First World War. Now, last time we talked about the home front, which, again, and I've said it a few times now, this is going to be probably the more important stuff to, like, really drill down to and remember, but also this little bit about how the war ends and what the American uh, President Woodrow Wilson's and the American government's uh, role in this is also one of the big takeaways for World War I. And it's one that's going to resonate, okay? Because while I'm not going to explain it all today, um, what you should see with how the end of the war occurs and particularly how the treaty negotiations at the, uh, in Versailles play out in 1919 should help explain later on why we are going to have a second world war, at least in part, not all by itself, but at least in part, uh, that story begins today. Um, so let's go ahead and jump on into it. Now, as I mentioned last time, as we were talking about the home front, because it applies to the home front as well, it is... This conflict is a total war, and it becomes a total war, maybe not immediately, but uh, you could probably say by the end of 1914, the European combatants are already acting as if this is a total war, so most of the war is under this, and when we join in 1917 um, and start sending troops over in large numbers by 1918, this is also true for us, and... Um, this sort of sets the stage for the next conflict, World War II, to very much begin as a total war right from the onset. Now, again, we've talked about total war in this class, uh, most notably when we talked about the American Civil War, but what are we talking about when we say total war? Okay, well, the governments, the combatants on all sides, will commit all of their resources, like everything that they possibly can, towards winning this war. Okay, so resources, you know, mines, farms, you name it, the industries that use those products, they're all, to some extent, and it's different in each country how it works, but they're all, in some extent, under the direct purview of the government to produce for the benefit of winning the war. We see out of citizens, soldiers will be drafted, the media and individuals are censored, uh, propaganda is created. This is not... Uh, just something that happens in the United States. This happens to all of the major combatants. And that this is a really important point. The enemy is not just the soldiers on the other side. It's not just, you know, two armies lining up against each other and those are the bad guys. No, it's the entirety of the nation are the bad guys. It's not just the German army. It is, it is Germany that is the bad guy for the Allied powers and vice versa. Now, we see that part of what makes this total war and this conflict so much different, though, is that since, you could say, the American Civil War, the 1860s, technology has become so far to make total war far more destructive than even it was during that time period. Um, through the duration of the war, several new inventions are introduced, some near the beginning, like machine guns, Others, like tanks and airplanes, as we go through the war, okay? Um, Flamethrowers, poison gas, blimps, heavy artillery, submarines, U-boats. All of these are coming to the fore as this conflict begins or continues on till 1918. Um, now, the airplanes pretty minorly used, okay, this is time where the engines are not too strong, so, like, we're talking more like dog fights, like, if I'm sure you've heard of the Red Baron, that's the kind of thing to expect, you know, bombers were, like, guys who, like, flew over and, like, threw grenades out of their uh, planes, so it's still very rudimentary, but it did exist. Uh, tanks uh, were designed to deal with the trenches, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, they become much more important in World War II, but this is where they're first kind of put out there. Uh, poison gases, and there's not just one, there, there are several uh, that are used uh, by 
both Allied and Central Power forces during the war. Um, many, many different ones. For example, one of them they use is chlorine, uh, which um, is uh, basically going to do is uh, the once you inhale it, um, it's going to make it make you unable to have the oxygen that you breathe in in your air actually like attached to your uh, to your lungs and get into your bloodstream, so you're able to breathe, and, but you don't actually get anything out of the breathing until you suffocate and die, okay? Others, mustard gas could, could cause um, burns inside and outside of your body, on your skin and into your, uh, your, your uh, esophagus and windpipe and so on. Um, brutal, awful things that, you know, that's why they had the gas masks. And in a pinch, if you didn't have a gas mask, they told you to take a rag and urinate on it and put it on your face because uh, in the case of things like chlorine gas, that can actually um, uh, neutralize it to some extent. But the most notable one, the most notable weapon as far as the overall fighting of the war is going to be the machine gun. Now, in the American Civil War, we had very basic machine guns, the Gatling gun, that'd be like hand cranked and it could shoot like many, many bullets at a time. Uh, by this time, though, you have the fully automatic machine guns that could be kind of placed, you know, at strategic points and you could literally mow down a, a, a approaching troops like, like that. Um, that was a huge problem early on in the war as both sides, the Germans... Uh, and the Allies, the Central and the Allies, would use frontal attacks to charge their enemy's front lines to try and do a bayonet charge or something, or even use cavalry in the very early stages of the war in August and September of, of 1914 uh, to run into these, these machine guns and just be entirely mowed down, uh, which eventually necessitated the, the, a new tactic. Uh, one that had existed in warfare before, but is used to a huge extent in World War I, trench warfare. Now, at the height of the war, these trenches on the Western Front, most notably, because that's where the war doesn't move too much, they would go literally from like the English Channel, the, the Atlantic, to like the Alps in like a, a uninterrupted chain. Of, of, of trenches created uh, piece by piece, day by day, week by week, month by month through the course of World War I. Now, eventually, these, these trench systems become remarkably complex. There wasn't just one front line. There, were, there was the front line and then support trenches behind them and then artillery behind that. There were vertical uh, ways to get back to the back of the line and get back up to the front when needed. Uh, but probably the most notable bit of the trenches or what's in between the trenches, the no man's land, which would be um, riddled with barbed wire uh, to kind of keep forward advances from, from happening, uh, with uh, artillery uh, explosions, uh, making huge craters, uh, some unexploded ordinances, and then, of course... Uh, the bodies of men and horses and other uh, uh, and other uh, items that they brought with them left in these no man's lands to a certain extent in some places left throughout the duration of the war. Um, this trench warfare made it where the fighting was very static and it didn't move a whole lot in that. Um, really, with the exception of the very beginning and the very end of the war, on the Western Front, not really much advances are made by either army, uh, which makes this war much more a war of attrition and helps to explain just the, the remarkable casualty numbers. Now, by the time we joined the war in 1917, the war has already uh, been fought for three years, and on the Western Front in particular, it is at a bloody stalemate. Um, and while we don't need to know all of these battles, um, just, just a little bit of description really just like boggles the mind. Um, 
like for example, uh, see the Battle of Verdun around the important French fortress of Verdun uh, lasted several months, and by the end of it, um, mil millions of men had died just at Verdun on either side. Uh, the death tolls in the first days of the wars uh, of the battle were were in the the hundreds of thousands um, due to artillery firing, amongst other things. Um, at certain points, it was said at Verdun, like, you couldn't even differentiate in individual artillery explosions. It was just like a low-grade rumble, like an earthquake, like, for, for hours and hours. Um, the Somme up uh, more northern France uh, is remembered for being such a soggy battlefield that um, at some, certain points, men literally, like, sink into the mud like like quicksand um and that uh you know as it rains on uh gas that was unexploded or gas that had like settled like it would get into the water supplies and that water and that water would be contaminated and that's what people had to drink i mean just it's it's just staggering the amount of of death and destruction um that happens and this has a lot to do with by the by that point with those two battles by 1916, both sides, the Central Powers and the Allied Powers, their plan is to kill as many of their enemies as they can to win. Um, now, the Atlantic is a particular focus for Americans because, well, of course, that's partially what drew us into the war, but now we have to get our soldiers over to Europe, which means we have to fight against these U-boats, uh, and that often would necessitate the use of convoys to protect each other. Now, one area that we don't talk a lot about for our purposes is what happens on the Eastern Front, but there is one very important thing that happens on the Eastern Front, uh, where for most of the war, the Germans are very much having the upper hand on their Russian enemies. Uh, but Russia has some particular problems unique to them. Um, they, of all of the major powers, maybe with the exception of the Ottomans, were the least prepared for this war, uh, both economically and militarily. Uh, they didn't have enough weapons for their men. They didn't have nearly as advanced military technologies as their fellow allied powers, and certainly as the Germans. And so we see that um, this causes massive problems for the soldiers, and, and also affects civilians, as particularly food runs short of supply uh, for the Russians. Now, that is the context wherein there is a series of revolutions. One earlier in 1917 um, that causes uh, the uh, Russians to reevaluate, but they still stay in the war. Um, but the more notable one, happens months later in November of 1917. Technically, this is called the October Revolution because it happens in the, the, in the Russian calendar in October, but in our calendar, it happens in November of 1917, uh, where uh, the Bolshevik faction of communists takes over control of the government, overthrows the Russian government at that point, uh, imprisons the Tsar... Tsar Nicholas II and his family, um, and begins the process of creating the Soviet Union, uh, which would eventually come to being by the time we're in the 1920s, um, making it the first communist nation in world history. Uh, now, one of the most notable things, at least for our purposes now talking about World War I, is that Lenin and the Bolsheviks do... Uh, remove the Soviet Union or the Russia from the war, um, signing a separate peace with the Germans uh, that takes them out of the war early, uh, which to the Germans is, is very pivotal because that allows them to move resources to the Western Front to fight against the Western allies, um, but also uh, will start setting the stage for some events to come that we'll talk more about in period 7b, and then, of course, as we get after World War II to the Cold War as well. Now, 
as far as we go, um, by the end of 1917, we have done something pretty remarkable and trained an army of almost, not quite, 4 million men uh, from an original number of just over 200,000 men we had in the army. And so starting in the spring of 1918, uh, uh, groups of about 100,000 American soldiers each will start to go across every month into France. Um, not just soldiers, but also food, supplies, weapons, and munitions going to our European allies. Now, we were very, very hesitant on many levels to join this war, but one reason we definitely were hesitant to join this war was that there was a lot of, lot of concern about what would happen if these American boys started fighting. Would they be just sent off to go into no man's land and die by French you know, commanders or British commanders. And so one of the things that is done is that uh, we set up an organization, the American Expeditionary Forces, under which our boys will fight, okay, under American commanders working in conjunction with the British and the French, um, which allows us to have a lot of control. With that said, we do actually loan out black soldiers to the French troops especially um, to fight, which would actually be the only way that American uh, Af African Americans actually fight, you know, on the front lines in this war. Most African American troops in the American Army were support troops working on uh, uh, getting some ferrying supplies around. Uh, but several African Americans do win medals from the French government for their actions during World War One. Now. There are some important like battles we are involved in, most notably um, during the Kaiserschlacht, uh, uh, kind of like Kaiser's Offensive uh, of spring 1918. We do kind of play an important defensive role um, in a few different uh, battles. Uh, one, um, for example, the Battle of Bellow Wood during this larger offensive. Americans very adeptly hold back a German advance at a very pivotal point. But in the end, a lot of what we do for the Allies is just be extra bodies. Because the Germans, by 1918, they're fighting with veterans that have been fighting for months, maybe years. So many of their best soldiers have died during other points of the war, and they're drafting near the bottom of the barrel. And just us having some healthy men to go alongside the British and French troops who are similarly banged up um, is, is a pivotal moment because if the Germans can't overrun the Western Front with, with just a few more Americans, it, it's a losing proposition for them as more and more Americans arrive in the spring and summer of 1918. Now, fighting does continue through the summer, uh, but uh, that will slowly start to push closer and closer to Germany, um, as by the fall of 1918, Germany is increasingly isolated uh, as their allies... The Ottomans, the Bulgarians, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, all in the fall of 1918 begin to, to literally collapse um, and uh, therefore uh, ask for peace. And that leads the German government um, to finally sue for peace, uh, asking for an armistice on, in uh, search of a peace treaty, which is uh, implemented on November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m. Now, uh, today, uh, November 11th, is still an important day. In America, we usually celebrate this as Veterans Day, uh, which is a post-World War II change. Originally, we also celebrated Armistice Day, but places like uh, Europe, Canada, Australia, uh, other places touched in some way by World War I, they still today celebrate Armistice Day uh, to celebrate the end of World War I in, in November, November 11th. Now, I'm going to see some, some graphic images here. They're not too bad, but I think it's important to just be a little honest about the outcomes of this war. Um, 22 million dead, mostly soldiers, but with some civilians. Um, I mean, there's... It, 
the only war that stacks up close to that is World War II, which is so much worse. But again, remember that these people have not seen World War II yet. They, they can't imagine something worse than this, even though we know there will be. Um, it's a staggering loss of life. I mean, just in places in Britain, like, there are entire towns where, like, all their young men of a certain age, they all died. Um, and none of them came back, or, or in some cases maybe a couple of them came back. But, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just a huge toll. It took years to dig up all the bodies on the old battlefields um, to, to bury them all. Uh, and this battlefield cemetery gives you an idea. I mean, if every cross there is a person, I mean, that's just, by the background, you, you can't even tell how many there are. Hundreds, thousands. Not all of the soldiers uh, that are hurt die. Um, thankfully, we are advancing with medical technology by the 1910s. And this makes it where... If you're injured, especially in an extremity, like your, your, your arms or your legs, we are more capable to save your life than in any other time before this. But the thing that they can't really do is save the limb. The way they save your life is by amputating the limb, stopping the, the, the bleeding, and stabilizing you. And so we see there are a lot of soldiers, like you see on the left, that uh, lose extremities due to shrapnel, arms, legs, amongst other things. You see that things like mustard gas and other shrapnel hitting your face cause uh, facial disfigurements as well. Um, this uh, era, uh, the, the soldiers that come out of this with facial disfigurations would often be kind of the first um, people treated on with kind of the beginnings of what we today call plastic surgery, uh, which today is much more for cosmetic reasons. Uh, for people that just don't like the way their nose looks or something. But the first, like, intros to that happen with these young men that lost, you know, parts of their face or major scarring to try to alleviate that. Um, but, again, not all of the wounds are, are physical. There are a lot of, of mental wounds. Uh, now, this is before the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder has been kind of formalized, uh, but we can look back with that lens and see that there were a lot of men that came out of this war uh, with remarkable cases of PTSD. Uh, in that time, they, they called it, for the most part, they called it shell shock. The idea was that the actual rumbling and shaking that could occur when these artillery shells fell around your bunkers and stuff and around the trenches that literally the shaking and the concussion of the blast could like cause brain damage, which is why uh, that um, that uh, anxiety and stress was triggered. Uh, but now we know it's less about maybe the physical physical shaking of the brain, although that can play a part, and a lot more about the just intense anxiety these men would be under for the days and weeks they were on the front lines, not knowing if that next boom is going to be right on their head, and that's going to be it. Uh, which for some men was the case, but for many others, they, they lived through that, but processing that is just a whole other thing. Physical devastation is huge as well. So this shows us a village in eastern France near the front lines of the western front. What I want you to take particular notice in this image is this church steeple, that's the spire you see kind of in the background. So this is Esnes before the war. This is Esnes after the war. Now to the, a little bit to the right, you see that church tower not so intact anymore. Um, this is near Verdun, where that massive battle occurred. Uh, this is Hotel de la Princerie. For, sorry if my French is off, awful. Uh, this is it before. This would be like kind of a government office. Um, now it has a skylight in the middle. And the reality is, is that many of these eastern French cities and towns, mostly towns, they're, they're not rebuilt after the war. They're just abandoned because it would cost too much to rebuild, rebuild them. There's so little left and all the people have left and they're all refugees now. Um, and in fact... Uh, in the fields of France, still today, farmers tilling their land 
still have to worry for unexploded tra uh, ordinances from World War One, not World War Two, World War One, and still today in like the 2020s, um, uh, farmers like they might hit hit like something that's coming up in the, the dirt and it explodes and they get hurt or they're digging up stuff and they put it on their side of the road for like recycling to pick up. That's still common in in Western France or Eastern France. Now, as far as deaths in total, when we look at this, you see that as far as we go, because when we enter the war so late, we don't really bear any near the brunt of this. When we get to World War II, that's going to be closer, okay, but, but not even still as much as what the Europeans face. But when you look at these other numbers, Germany, 1.8 million dead, because remember they're fighting on two fronts in the east and the west. Russia, 1.7 million. Uh, just against the Germans. France, 1.3 million. Austria-Hungary, 1.2 million. The British Empire, 900,000. Um, and that includes people from, again, the British Empire. So not just Britain, but Canada, India, Australia, and so on. But this really gives you kind of a big idea of what I'm talking about here, okay? Uh, so this one just doesn't account for the number dead, but like how many people they put into the fight and what happened to them. Uh, so, like, if you look, the Russia put 12 million men into the fight, uh, but after that, if each little person there counts for 100,000 people, you see that? Like, that's a huge amount, okay? About 5 million wounded, 2.5 million, they don't know, prisoners are missing in action, and then killed, 1.7 million. Um, Germany, uh, 11 million, and then they come out with 4.2 million wounded, 1.8 million killed. Um, this one's crazy. Look at Austria-Hungary. 7.8 million people that fight in that war, and that was a lot of people for that small empire. But look at look at that. There, there's only about 700,000 soldiers fighting for Austria-Hungary that come out of this unscathed. Another 3.6 million uh, wounded 2.2 million just missing. We don't know what happened to them. Presumably dead. 1.2 million apps, uh, known dead. Uh, that that's crazy. And in, in comparison, we look at the United States. Um, most of our men come back uninjured and unharmed, uh, and that's just not the case for these other major combatants in the war. Now, Wilson. Going back to our story, Woodrow Wilson, while we are actively working to send troops over to Europe, is thinking a step ahead about what the end of this war is going to look like. By January of 1918, it's not done in any way. We still have several more months to fight. But the idea that if the American forces can kind of just stop another German advance and just be bodies, if that works, which many allies are thinking it will, the war will come to a close with an Allied victory. But what Wilson's thinking about is, well, we got into this war. How do we not allow this to happen again? How do we make this the war to end all wars? Okay. To this point, he came up with a plan. It had 14 points in the plan. And so we unimaginatively call this the 14 points. Okay. Now, we could break them up into sections. The first five points, one through five, they dealt very specifically with the things that began the war and, and pulled the United States into the war, okay? So stuff like open diplomacy, where everyone's aware of whose allies are, okay, instead of secret alliances and uh, things happening in the background, happening up in the open. Freedom of the seas, so that trade can happen unimpeded. Um, removal of economic barriers and trade barriers that cause uh, competition economically, reduction in armaments and weaponry of all kinds to kind of not make people want to use those weapons in a war, um, and then finally, adjustment of colonial claims to impartially mediate and kind of get rid of the colonies or to uh, otherwise organize them in a more international and diplomatic way. <clears throat> now, the next set of points, the next eight from six to 13, 
uh, dealt with um, the uh, kind of post-war structural issues, uh, particularly with what to do with the empires that have broken apart as part of the war. Okay, uh, Russia, who was not privy to this, is already leaving the war. What happens to the areas conquered by Germany uh, in Russia? Uh, who gets that land? Um, the restoration of French territories taken by the Germans uh, during the war. Uh, redrawing of Italian borders, especially with Austria-Hungary. Uh, the division of the rest of Austria-Hungary into kind of individual states uh, to kind of allow uh, some sort of self-determination there for the ethnic groups living in the very diverse Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, redrawing Balkan boundaries, kind of to the point of what the Serbians were seeking at the beginning of the war, to kind of make sure these ethnic groups are more fairly organized um, into national boundaries. Uh, limitations on Turkey, which is emerging as the strongest constituent part of the now defunct Ottoman Empire. Um, and then establishment of an independent Poland, independent of Germany and Russia, uh, as a kind of border in between the two. Something that hadn't existed for about 100 years at that point. Um, now, the last point of the 14 points, though, is probably the most important. A, as Wilson put it, a general association of nations that would protect great and small states alike. This was uh, very quickly given the name of the League of Nations, pretty good name, okay, for what it's trying to do. Uh, and it would be there to act as a way to negotiate diplomatically and hash out problems without warfare between major states in Europe and in the rest of the world, okay? Now, these terms are very attractive to the Central Powers, most notably Germany, okay? Why? Well, because you don't see anything in there about, like, punishing the Central Powers, okay? They're going to lose land, they're going to lose some territory, but that's small potatoes compared to what maybe could, be, could happen which could be, you know, massive reparations payments, for example, okay? And so, when Wilson presents it in January of 18, he's trying to get the Germans to kind of agree to it then, but the Germans, as they're pre preparing their last offensive, they're like, well, no, 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 we're going to give it one last shot. But, of course, after that offensive fails... The Germans, as they approach November of 1918, they are hoping this is the format of the new treaty because if that was the case, well, that would be to their benefit. But the thing is, is that Wilson's the one supporting the 14 points. His allies in Europe, not so much, okay? Um, it would bring, as Wilson said, peace without victory, okay? It would, it would settle this and hopefully settle conflicts in the future. But the leaders, particularly of Britain and France, they don't want to hear this. This isn't what they're thinking about with this treaty. They want to punish someone, most notably the Germans. So as the premier of France, Georges Clemenceau, said, quote, God gave us the Ten Commandments and we broke them. Wilson gives us the 14 points. We shall see. Yeah, not, not, not good. Right there from the jump. Um, so the main four negotiators at the uh, Versailles Conference, uh, or the Paris Conference, um, Versailles just right outside of Paris, if you don't remember your world history, uh, were David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, George Clemenceau, just spoken about, the Premier of France, uh, the Italian Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando, who helps to shift over the Italians from the Central Powers to the Allies in 1915, and then finally Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. President. Now, they do it in Versailles, the, the old Grand Palace of Louis XIV, you know, uh, pretty impressive place to do it. They do it in the Hall of Mirrors, one of the most impressive parts of Versailles, beginning on January 18th, 1919. So it does take a couple months for them to get it together. Now, Wilson will go to Paris and represent America himself in Paris as part of the American delegation. However, 
and this is important, he doesn't ask any senator to come with him, not Democrat or Republican, um, which is important because in our system under the Constitution, all treaties, like this treaty, they cannot just be negotiated by the president and, and done. They have to be ratified by the Senate. There's number one. We'll come back to that. And not just no senator, no Republican politicians of any type uh, in the House of Representatives or, or other you know, uh, Republican former politicians, n no one is asked to come. Uh, and that was important because the Republicans had control of both the House and Senate starting in the 1918 midterm elections. We'll, we'll come back around to that. Wilson also realized that his allies were not on the same page with him, as already mentioned. Uh, most notably, again, Great Britain and France, they wanted to make Germany pay for the suffering that their people endured. To them, the Germans made this war what it was. Their argument is that the Germans had the most culpability for this because when they heard Russia was going to invade or, or, or help protect Serbia, they could have said, no, we don't want to go to war with Russia and their allies, France and maybe Britain. We, they could have stopped it there. Now, I don't know how great of an argument that really is. Um, in reality, the allied powers, Britain and uh, uh, France especially, they were... They were itching for a war, too, to a certain extent. But as they say, to the, the winner, the victor goes to spoils. And so they're the ones able to make this argument, and the Germans can't really counter it. They, they lost, okay? So in the Treaty of Versailles uh, negotiations, they did do some very explicit things to punish Germany, like making them give up tons of territory, which was going to probably happen under the 14 points anyway, but not just that. This is probably the biggest, the biggest two. The war guilt clause that said unilaterally the cause of World War I, the First World War, was Germany. No one else had played nearly as big of a part. And two, to that point, Germany was then forced to pay reparations, set at that time $33 billion to the Allies, most notably Britain and France, to pay for all the destruction and death that they, as sole causes of the war, had made happen. Okay. Now, this all is dismaying to Wilson. This is not peace without victory. This is not what he envisioned when he wrote the 14 points, and this is certainly not what the Germans thought they were agreeing to as they came to uh, visit in Paris uh, to end this war, but... Wilson accepts it. Why? Because one of the things that the uh, Allies did like from his 14 points was the idea of the League of Nations. And so they include the creation of the League of Nations as part of the Treaty of Versailles. And so even though this is a punishment on Germany, Wilson did believe that over time the League of Nations could maybe help fix those. Maybe they maybe they'd get rid of the reparations as part of their decisions as the League of Nations, okay? Um, in that there are provisions for collective security wherein all members of the League would protect each other from outside members, aggressors, uh, that would ensure international peace and would make World War I the war to end all wars, in theory. Now, Wilson signs on to this document, but again, he cannot just sign on to it unilaterally. He has to take it back to our senators. Um, and that's where the problem arises, the true problem. Now at that point, we had 48 states, so that meant we had 96 senators, 48 times 2 is 96. Um, and the senators are roughly evenly split into three different groups on the issue of the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the first group I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, the internationalists. These were folks that liked Wilson. A lot of them were Democrats. Not all of them, but many of them were. And they generally supported the treaty as it was written. They don't have questions about it. They support Wilson um, without question. And so they're with it, right? So that's about a third of the Senate. They're on board. We're going to sit them aside, okay? The second group also we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about because this group is kind of the opposite. The irreconcilables, uh, mostly Republicans, 
who, uh, uh, led by William Bora, who they, they oppose the treaty no matter what. Like, they're not going to like this treaty no matter what. So we'll set that third aside, okay? They can't be convinced. But there was a large group in the middle who we would call the reservationists who were open to ratifying the treaty, but they wanted some changes to the treaty before that could occur. Most notably ones that they felt would limit Americans' authority to make their own decisions or otherwise give the League of Nations more authority over American decisions. We'll spend more time on this group because they're the ones in the middle. Now, the person who led the reservationists was this guy, Senate Majority Leader Henry Cabot Lodge. We talked about him as kind of leading the charge into the Spanish-American War. So he was, you know, one of the jingos as we talked about it in that time period. Um, and he's not unilaterally against, like, international cooperation. Not completely. But what Lodge and the people following him, the reservationists, have a problem with is the collective security provision. Now, this provision, Article 10 of the League Covenant, what it said was that in the case of aggression against a member of the League of Nations, all members of the League are, are forced to declare war on the aggressor as an act of collective security. Okay? Now, this idea, which today is a part of many different treaties, like the NATO Treaty, is an important idea because the basic idea is that if a, a great aggressor nation knows that if they invade a country that all these others are going to declare war on them too, that acts as a deterrent to aggression. They don't want to do it if they think they're going to lose and all the countries are going to gang up on them, right? And that's why Wilson wanted that in there. But Lodge and the reservationists hate this because they recognize, and this is true, that it would limit American sovereignty, okay? It would, limit, it would undermine the power of Congress, like the Senate and the House, to declare war because all of a sudden we might be drawn into a conflict by the rules of this covenant not because the people of the United States wanted to go to war or, or the politicians and the, the Congress wanted to go to war. No, it would be because the League determined we weren't going to war. Now, Wilson comes out swinging at the reservationists. And he says, listen, no, we, we cannot do this change. We can't get rid of the collective security provision because... We have to participate in, quote, unless America takes part in this treaty, the world is going to lose heart because, again, it was our idea, right? Now, Wilson doesn't think the Senate gets the picture, um, and he's not willing to compromise one little bit. So what does he do? Well, he goes on a public relations campaign, and he leaves D.C. and goes across the country trying to drum up support for the League of Nations as part of the Treaty of Versailles, trying to go to the people and go around the senators and put pressure on the senators through their constituents. Now, in this whirlwind, he will travel 8,000 miles. He gives 37 speeches in 29 different cities. And the thing is, is that he gives different speeches in every different city. He doesn't always use the same arguments. He tailors them to the area, and he's very persuasive and passionate about this, saying, amongst other things, that America is, quote, the nation upon which the whole world depends to hold the scales of justice even. So which is it, right? Which is it? How should we look at this League of Nations? Should we look at it like in this left cartoon where you have uh, the League of Nations bridge designed by the president of the USA, but you got Uncle Sam chilling on one side with his head on the keystone, this unfinished bridge, the gap in the middle, which if you don't know the keystone, that's where all the weight goes and the keystone has to be strong to keep the whole bridge afloat. Eventually that bridge will fall down unless you sit down the keystone. Or is it as the reservationists believe that really this League of Nations is hand-stringing us and tying America's hands behind their back figuratively uh, to take away their power? <gasps> It's a matter of debate. Now, in the end, something very consequential occurs. Three weeks into this trip, his whirlwind uh, PR blitz, Wilson 
collapsed from exhaustion. Um, and a couple of days later, he suffers a stroke. Uh, now, his physicians believe, you know, this is partially due to health and age, but partially also due to the immense stress he was under with this undertaking. Um, and it's bad. Uh, for weeks, he couldn't, sign, he couldn't sit up. He couldn't even sign his name. Uh, he couldn't talk for the first few days there, um, and it was so dicey, and his people around him knew it was so dicey, that only his doctor's wife and like the closest people could see him, and they kept it secret, um, because the president is clearly incapacitated. Now, he, he does regain some of his faculties by, say, the end of the year, um, going into 1920, but he's never going to be in good health again, and he's going to, he dies shortly after leaving office in the 1920s. Um, and, and actually, um, this creates a pretty interesting situation where his wife um, is known, not at the time, but now to have literally signed documents as the President of the United States, which has led um, some historians, kind of tongue-in-cheek, to argue that uh, the first woman president uh, was Edith Wilson, um, his wife. Now, what is the impact on the Treaty of Versailles ratification of the Senate, though? With Wilson's pressure gone, and it did seem that might have done something, but with his pressure gone, the Senate, they move ahead, and they vote down the Treaty of Versailles, meaning we never join the League of Nations. Um, eventually, in 1920, we have to sign a separate peace with Germany because technically we would be still be at war if we don't sign the treaty. So we sign separate pieces with them that you know don't have anything about the League of Nations in it, just end the war. And we don't ever join this organization. And Wilson will leave office a beaten and embittered man, not much longer for this world. And we know now that our decision not to join the League of Nations would be one piece of other pieces that helped to contribute to the growth of aggression amongst fascist countries in the 1930s, which by the end of that decade will lead us into the Second World War. But that's getting further into period 7b than I want to right now. That will wrap us up for period 7a. So uh, after our test, next time, uh, we will be picking up with the 1920s and our return to normalcy, but that'll be next time. See you then. Bye.